This is the Criterion Creeps podcast. Tonight we're talking about two films, uh, I guess involving Carl Theodore Dreyer. Uh, the first one, directed by old Dreyer, uh, Gertrude from 1963. The synopsis here from Letterboxd. Hopeless romantic Gertrude inhabits a turn-of-the-century milieu of artists and musicians where she pursues an idealized notion of love that will always elude her. She abandons her distinguished husband and embraces an affair with a young concert pianist who falls short of her desire for lasting affection. When an old lover returns to her life, fresh disappointments follow, and Gertrude must try to come to terms with reality. Uh, yeah. So, in some ways, RJ, I feel like we could have mm-hmm. recorded all of the Dreyer films in one episode. Uh, I fucking told you that before I, we did this. I know, and you're right. I'm going to give you this one here. Okay. Um, we okay, could have done good. it all in one go, but, uh-huh. I mean, when you look at that on paper, you go, boy, that's a lot of movies to watch in, like, a short period of time. And it's just like, you know what? We're, we're going to give uh, we're going to give Dreyer some, some space. Let him breathe. Give us an opportunity to really, like, absorb and watch these movies mm-hmm. the way they're meant to be watched. Now, I had never seen Gertrude. Um I never really like gone on my way to read much about it. It was always just kind of like, oh, I had to get around to watching that one day. I've got this DVD box set, and uh, I haven't watched the second half of it. So we'll mm-hmm. save them all up. That was another aspect too. Is like, well, I'm gonna be watching these like for the first time, so I didn't want to like overload myself by watching four movies in like two days. So yeah. we spread it out, and uh, I got to watch Gertrude for the very first time. My first note here is, huh. <laughs> Um, mm-hmm. it becomes very apparent, uh, that this is not for me. Uh, yeah. there are lots of characters talking while not looking at one another. And, uh, this talking is like at the camera, not at the, and talking no, at they're, the never, they're never talking at the camera though. Okay, so that's that's very they're looking. They're, they're looking they're, off. It seems like when there's like moments where like it builds to like a, a dramatic mm-hmm. cres- a crescendo, and like they talk directly at the camera when they're like actually looking at the other person, um, mm-hmm. and they're like they're always kind of moving in and out, and there's like always somebody in the foreground, and they're looking down, looking up, looking away at nothing in particular, while another character is like at their back, looking also longingly into the distance, and they're just mm-hmm. having these conversations about things. And that's the movie for two hours. Two full hours almost. Pretty it's much. It's like 150 or something. Yeah, 156. Um, Yeah, man. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, this, this, you tell me this, how you really feel? This, this brought back uh, flashbacks to La Ventura that, uh, ah, a- that yeah. Antonioni... <laughs> Um, as far as like, so like, oh, is this, is this that ennui business I've been hearing about? Um, sweet. I was kind of like, so I, I definitely watched the first half hour of this movie. Like I, 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 I did watch it. And then what what a mark of, uh, just like prestige. uh, They should put that on the cover. I definitely watched the first (laughs) half an hour of this. I definitely did. Cause I was like, okay, well, this is like one long extended sequence of Mm -hmm. this lady, this Gertrude talking with like this guy who's got ambitions to be a politician or some shit and like be a minister. And he's like, you coming along for the ride? And she's like, I don't know. I just don't know about this. And there might be somebody else. And they're playing these games off of one another. And then like when she finally is like, yeah, maybe I'm, maybe I'm going to sleep with another guy. And the guy's like, well, 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 why would you do that? Like, he's just all like, Whoa, that's not very ladylike. Uh, what about my feelings? Um, and you know, there's like a painting of like a naked little chick in a, on a tapestry later on with a bunch mm-hmm. of dogs at her feet. And you're like, yeah, I get it. I get, I get the symbolism. I, I get it. It's like all mm-hmm. these dudes looking after this lady and she's got these impossible standards, just like letterbox informs us on the, the synopsis. But, uh, my other note here is I want to die. Um, in the movie or in I, real life? I, I wanted this. I wanted it to stop. I, this is okay. like absolutely not the type of movie i go into watch uh ponderous uh i've seen some people like throw some 
accolades this this movie's way about like it really doesn't start to come together to like the third or fourth or fifth time you watch it and you really start to appreciate the the film no. craft on display and the camera work and the performances and film craft. yeah exactly uh baked fresh from the the danish oven um of dryer's mind uh yeah man Can this I this is this yeah yeah I, I was just about to hand it off to you this okay. movie is not a good time I did not enjoy watching this. Um, this is like, as uh, our good friend and listener, longtime listener, Oliver Granger pointed out uh, about, at least he says this about Dreyer in general, but it's just like, this is some shit Bergman. Um, mm-hmm. And I was like, wow, the first two movies, that's that's kind of unfair. It's, it's harsh. I, I, I like the first uh, two movies in this box set. I like that Ordet uh, quite mm-hmm. a bit. And I think Dave Rath's pretty good. This though... Who man, this uh, I don't know who this is for. Yeah. Uh, so the the one thing I'll, I'll just add to what you're saying before I take off is when you're when people say stuff like, "Oh, it's not really until you watch it the fourth or fifth time." This bat like this bullshit homework background stuff you have to do for movies. It's it's total horseshit, man. It's the same reason I have a problem with four hundred blows. And that infamous bad review we got as a podcast where the guy was like, if you have any, if you do your homework on the context of the scene when this movie came out. And it's just like, that's not what a movie should be about. If I can't watch it one time and enjoy it, I'm never going to watch it fucking four times. Or it's like if I have to look at about like the political climate of 1930s France to enjoy like what 400 blows was or say Gertrude. It's like, if I have to watch Gertrude 14 fucking times to enjoy it, you know what? It's not a good okay. movie. Would you like to hear what a fairly popular online critic and a, a podcaster, Peter Labuza had to say about this? This is, this is a, sure. this is a four star review. Okay. He writes advanced studies for dryer rigorous in mm. ways one doesn't even know how to particularly articulate. <laughs> Dreyer's choices of <laughs> when to edit and when to pan or move the camera at first seem defiantly baffling until it all starts to form a logic with the narrative. The film has both the simplicity, woman's idealized version of love will always fail her, and yet an intense complexity that it's hard to know where to begin. <laughs> Paintings are key here. Reflections of narrative, all mainly Renaissance representational mm-hmm. art, save for that final one of the grotesque woman, her Dorian Gray. Compositions have an intense mm. stillness to them that registers almost beyond comprehension. Uh, Dan Salat pondered after the screening that only Dreyer would pull back the camera to end with not just the door, but the door and the table. Still an emotional gut punch once one has a handle on how to watch the film, especially that perfect two-shot of Gabriel relaying the story of the party to Gertrude, but certainly a film that requires multiple viewings to really even begin to build an understanding of everything that's happening here. Uh, I could continue. Um, No, I, I would prefer that you don't. Okay. I would prefer that you don't. Uh, there, 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 is ta- there, there, is, there, there is talk of dissertations. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I have more to say about Gertrude. Yes. Uh, one thing is a, a candid memory. Um, I always used to call my first vehicle Gertrude. Yeah. And like, you know how, uh, like, as Stephen King would say with Christine, you know, all good vehicles need a name. Um, I always thought Gertrude was really funny, like a really funny name. I was like, why would anyone be named Gertrude? Because I was insensitive, insensitive to other cultures, but uh, I still think it's funny. Uh, it's the same uh, Gertrude and Beatrice. I think are really funny names. I like the milk. Yeah. So if there's anyone listening and your names are Gertrude or Beatrice, uh, you uh, you oh. call me on my private line. You email in, and I'll give you my personal Snapchat. We'll uh, we'll talk sometime. Well, you could be like Gertie, Trixie. Don't rationalize these things, Jarrett. Gertrude and Beatrice. They're uh, they're quirky. They're fun. Yeah. So anyways, that was my personal history with Gertrude. So going into this, there was no way I was going to uh, appreciate it for what it was. Um, so with last week, we talked about those other movies. Uh, Day of Wrath, uh, I liked. Uh, it's, as you would put, front heavy or top heavy. And then the back end is a little uh, slow. Uh, Ordet, uh, I liked quite a bit more. Um, but neither of them, I think, were all-time bangers. Uh, Gertrude, I get into this thing 
And this thing is so heavy handed with what they're trying to do. Uh, like what you said, it's long, long scenes of people staring off and they're like, they're doing their monologues. Uh, the very first thing I wrote was, uh, so actorly yeah. uh, this this thing is so like it's just like act i, I can just picture john lovett saying acting acting uh, acting uh watching this thing because it's like the first scene it's like gertrude come here and she like comes to the door and then pauses and then takes a step in and then pauses and then takes a step in and then pauses it's just like holy shit this is not how people behave in real life it's not h- normal human behavior so there's like this weird actorly quality and it's kind of like Broadway, like a play. I think that's yeah. what this is supposed to be as a play. But in a movie, it comes off so like stiff and it's like st- like stilted movements and the way that they deliver their their lines. It it doesn't come off like a movie and it seems it seems off like it's not natural. You know what I mean? J J dog. Yeah. No. So it is definitely based on a play. Uh, of, of this name, same name by Hallmar Soderberg. Ex- who? Hallmar Hall, Soderberg. Oh yeah, yeah. That's the dude who wrote I Robot, right? Yeah, yes. That's uh, old uh, Isaac Asimov. Soderberg. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, right. Well, what, is, uh, what, what, else, what else does Wikipedia here say? It's notable uh, for notable for its many long takes. One of which is nearly. A ten-minute take of Gertrude and her ex-lover Gabriel talking about their pasts. Okay, can sure, I? Sure is. Sure. Can is. I say something? Yeah. Uh, long takes aren't uh, the mark of good uh, filmmaking. Uh, I I can't stand when people say that it's like oh long takes like tracking shots these like long monologue scenes. It's amazing. It's it's incredible. Like I remember that's what a lot of people said about. Uh, like call me by your name and like shit like that. And it's like, those, that that's not marks of great filmmaking. It's like, that's just a really well acted scene or well directed scene. That doesn't mean your movie is good. So like this scene, if you had told me, like you just said that there was a 10 minute long scene, I had no idea. Cause for me, this whole movie was like four mm. scenes that were each like 20 minutes long without yeah. cuts. Yeah, 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 that's yeah. how it seemed to me. Like pretty, pretty close I, to that. I, I didn't pick up on that at all because the entire movie just felt like this long drawn out thing to me. So it's like, no, not long, long shots aren't always this thing that brings like elevates cinema. Mm-hmm. I don't know this, this whole movie, um, it feels off to me for a lot of different reasons because even like the main plot or the themes to this movie, it's this like false dichotomy of like work versus love where they're like, Oh, for a man, it's only two things, work or women. Or it's like work yeah. or love. It's like you cannot have both. You can only have the woman or you can have the love. Uh, that's not uh, whatever Swedish or whatever Danish. That's not that language, but that's a fun language for me to do. So th- there's like this big play on that. And then it gets like it gets really overbearing. I think halfway through this movie, we're like, fuck, I get it. It's like, I get it. This guy can either have a job or he can have his li- uh, his wife, which I don't think is necessarily true. There's a lot of people out there in the world that are like that, uh, like what I talked about in the preamble, which was a very fitting movie, that Netflix movie that I talked about where it's work and love. So there's a lot of people out there like that, but I think mostly it just comes down to like selfishness and people who don't want to do that. So... I don't really buy it in this movie, especially because it's like she has two guys that are so about work where you have. So it's one guy who's the guy she's currently married to who's all work until she leaves. And then he realizes you have the old lover who was all work and then she left him and now he wants her back and realizes that love is more important. And then you have the young guy who is all love, I guess, but with uh, everyone so like you, they give you three different stages of these things, but I don't think it's, I don't think it should be as rigid as it's like it's one or the other. These are your three types of guys. You have like Shit. the work guys, the love guys, or what? Mm. What are you talking about? Oh over man, there? I'm just skimming. So I'm on the reception of this movie. Um, okay, so this movie like it's it's divisive. 
Some people okay. love it. Some people boo it. This movie apparently has had many a screenings of people booing. Uh, then yeah. other, but then it's also had standing ovations. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, you know what I always feel like in those situations? But here's a – okay, continue. Uh, I was going to say I think the negative responses are a lot more genuine where the – when you get an audience that just fucking hates a movie, you're like, okay. Then you get an audience that's like really into it and standing and clapping. It's like, I wonder if those guys are just doing it to do it. Yeah. I don't know. Um, here, an article in Cinema 65 wrote that Dreyer has gone from serenity to senility. Not a film, but a two hour study of sofas and pianos. <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty accurate. Yeah, there's a whole lot of that going on in parks. Yeah, honestly, like they 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 try they try to reach for a lot of stuff where it's like love, free will, erotic ideas, like human behavior. But I don't I don't think there's ever an example of any of those that seems real. So this movie's like it reaches a lot for stuff, but it just doesn't feel doesn't feel like a real movie man or like real life for that for that matter like yeah man man yeah this gertrude gertrude nope yeah uh this movie also has the fakest messy room i've ever seen yeah there's like a scene where the lady's like oh i went to tidy up and i stumbled across like your dark secrets and she's like tidying up and there's like just stuff in places of the room and the worst one i saw was there's uh, a chair with two books on it and she picks them up and like puts them back on the desk. It's like, in what situation is a guy ever going to have two fucking books out like on a chair? He's not like a scholar or anything like that. He was just reading two different fiction books at the same time. <laughs> what is this? He must be this a, a horse. Shit. must be a genius. Anyways. Yeah. Gertrude's uh, Gertrude's a little weird, man. Yeah. Gertrude's a little weird. Got a, yeah, not a, not a fan here. Uh, this movie, because uh, I'm just bringing it up so that this isn't a five minute episode. Uh, there's another scene in this movie where uh, when the young lover sees her leaving and he waves at her and uh, you people listening can't see. But his like arm is straight up, but the hand is pointing down and he kind of just like jingles it like <laughs> side to side. It's like, who? that's not how people wave that. But. That's a description for this movie in general. It's like, that's not how people wave. And this movie isn't how people act. This is very unnatural, this whole thing. Yeah, it's... This whole thing is very unnatural. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, Gertrude's a weird, bad movie. And uh, you heard it here first. I think longtime listener uh, Oliver uh, Granger might have been right. Maybe this dryer guy uh, isn't all that. Well, I will note that he, uh, he, Oliver, did uh, rate this as twice as good while still not being good as cries and whispers which i feel mm. uh is a, it's a little much but uh yeah. you know <laughs> depends on the day you know i've had bad days too mm. where i rate things yeah the way they are so anyways yeah Gertrude. yeah yeah, yeah. hard pass yeah. for me uh yep. and then after that we got to watch a documentary about which yes, is we did. yeah it's this this is a spine number in the Criterion Collection. Uh, it is one one twenty one twenty eight. Uh, this is uh because Carl Theodore Dreyer, my meter from nineteen ninety five. Uh, the synopsis from Letterboxd. Torben Scott Jensen's elegant documentary is a collage of memories and reflections on one of cinema's greatest directors. Visually rich and densely layered, Carl Theodore Dreyer, my meter, illuminates an artist too little understood and too important to overlook. Through interviews, historical writings, and rare archival footage, a portrait of Dreyer emerges, an austere perfectionist, yes, but also a passionate man possessing a genuine sense of humor. Is this a synopsis? Yeah. Jesus, that's long. Yeah, it's a real, real back patter. All right, well, you hit me with what you think of this Carl T.H. Dreyer, my meat here. My meat here. So uh, my description of this is this is a very 90s about a director documentary uh, with high contrast atmospheric black and white footage with voiceover over top. Um, mm-hmm. It's, of course, like the big question here is going to be, why is this in the Criterion Collection? Yes. Um, yeah, I don't know, man. This is a special feature. 
uh, made with given the prominence of a spine number to f- round out a box set mm-hmm. is kind of but like, they already had three though they didn't really need a fourth yeah I don't know early decision making I guess in their world mm-hmm. why not throw it that way and uh, yeah this thing is like not even in the running for like great documentaries on a director or um, even good or even good i don't know did, did you watch uh the first half an hour of this for sure or... I, I, I did watch this um okay i don't know this is just like you this is for people who really want to like i guess like maybe get some anecdotes like this type of filmmaking is like past like we don't like these don't exist like i don't i know you don't watch special features on these uh dvds i used to <laughs> and like i i know for i know you don't Come on. And uh, oh, 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 I, I say. No, I don't. I know. So th- this is what these are like, though. And these this is very much of the era. This mm-hmm. is like, this was a, I think, made for television documentary. And uh, just just being like, hey, look at this guy. He's great. And it feels exactly like all these documentaries I've seen in my past. Uh, watching special features when I had time. Like, I don't even watch movies now, and let alone watching documentaries about people make movies. And especially if it's like, I don't want to go that extra mile and, like, have to find out how he was an orphan and he was treated meanly by his foster parents and said, you have to go work. And then, like, oh, I had to, I had to go work at a fucking film studio and make movies <laughs> when I was, like, 14. It's like, Poor you. Like, what the, like, oh, man, it's like, that would be fucking amazing. That's, like, the dream yeah. job now. But, like, obviously... It, different times right like this that was back when it was just mm-hmm. a job not like let's go work at the dream factory where rainbows mm-hmm. <laughs> come um, wow yeah there it is yeah so from a production standpoint uh this got some of that electronic orchestra score going on that's like straight mm-hmm. out of a charles band movie and it Ooh. it's uh it's some real Richard Band uh going on and it sucks. Mm-hmm. I hate this score. Like I electronic orchestra stuff always sounds bad unless it is uh E L O. Um this is this is not E L O. This is just like uh this sounds just as fine as like having like we, we can't afford like an orchestra to come in, but we can uh I can have a whole like eighty piece uh, orchestra here in my laptop and it sounds mm-hmm. like butt, but uh we didn't realize that, but they should have. What does it sound like? But. Nice. B U T T. Um nice. yeah, so I just have issues with this sort of packaging of a documentary. It's just like I would have gotten more information and it would have taken less time for me to read a good essay about Dreyer if I were so inclined mm-hmm. to do that and get into it. Um this is some weak stuff. Uh I mean, okay, so I've got some Maybe not rules, but like I like documentary filmmaking a lot. I like I actually okay. do really love documentary. Um, so this is it fails on a number of levels. First of all, like usually like great documentaries, they have like engaging characters or like like mm-hmm. a ton, like a lot of like engaging stories. You have like something that organically happens while making a documentary. Now, when you're making a documentary about a man that's been dead for decades it's kind of hard to like you won't believe the twist that he's alive or like this this happened or like mm-hmm. his house burnt down like i just watched a, a couple of weeks ago a documentary on joe sarno and he dies near the end of that documentary but he's alive and there's like you're you get to know these characters and it's like oh this like this is really sweet couple of like a guy who's essentially a pornographer um and you get to like hang out with them and they're like these people seem really sweet uh and this it's just like it's so after the fact and one of the, like the least favorite people of mine in this world are actors. I hate actors and the way they talk mm-hmm. because they're always on. But they, when, once they have like once the camera's on, they're on, and they they start going through these stories and like I don't know. It always boils down to uh, I don't know. Everything's stock in this. We made a movie. He was a genius. Yeah. It was great. People still talk to me about it. They come up to me and they say, wow, I loved you in that. And it's just like, what an experience. I can't believe you did this. And, or they say, oh, sometimes he was a real control freak. It's just like the like Mad Libs of documentaries about filmmakers uh, made in mm-hmm. like the 90s, well, especially after a director's dead. Because there's like, then you have like, well, we'll have a guy read quotes from his 
like diary or from his anecdotes and stuff like that. And it's just like, this is all this is once again. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's my rant about <laughs> my meter. Uh, this was like coming right off of uh, Gertrude and being like, well, let's see what this is in store. Oh yeah. This is exactly just a like documentary and not even like a good example of documentary filmmaking about uh, a director who made like one of the greatest movies of all time and made a whole mm-hmm. bunch of other movies, but uh, it just, it doesn't, it doesn't come together. It's like maybe sometimes like subjects don't need documentaries. And maybe that's, yep. that's a callous thing to say, but uh, sometimes you look at the thing you made and you're like, yeah, you put a lot of effort into something that like at the end of the day is still just not that interesting, I guess. Beyond mm-hmm. it's, it's a doc, mm-hmm. it's a document and assemblage, a collage of memories and reflections on one of the cinema's greatest directors. <laughs> But yeah, here, RJ. What the, what the fuck did you think of this thing? I think this thing fails on many different fronts. Uh, the first, I couldn't agree with you more that uh, this is a bonus feature. This isn't a full spine, and uh, we've talked about these things before. Where I think I've given my criteria for what I think a Criterion movie should be. There's three different types. And there, I've only ever dropped these a few times on movies that I feel like really don't belong in here. And uh, this is one that I uh, I feel the same way with. It's like this doesn't really need to be here for any reason. Uh, I know why they put it in here. Like you said, early days decision making. They were just set. box yeah. set. But it's like it didn't need to be a spine number. It could have just been a bonus feature. And if it was, you know what? Maybe we would have did this episode as three movies. And maybe you would have watched this on the side. And you would have been like, oh, yeah, it was okay. It was just a little bit more about yeah. these uh, movies. But now that we have to do it as an official spine number, it's just like, eh. It's like, uh, this is just, it doesn't need to be here. It shouldn't be here. And it's just, it was just a waste of time. Mostly. So, I mean, so this is, the, and that isn't like, uh, yeah. I'm not, I'm not the, trying to be like in the critical for, in, about in, in it. Terms, yeah. Just, in terms of like the format of what we're doing, yeah. this is like the one where you're just like, Ooh, it's kind of like the, I mean, it, it makes me think of the, uh, WC field six short films kind of thing yeah. where it doesn't fit the parameters of like how we do our show, which is like. Mm-hmm. I guess more of an issue for our show than it is for the film itself as like a thing that is like been uh, inducted into the Criterion Collection. Yeah, but like it's not. I don't think it's um, an issue for the show though, as it is for their spine numbering. Because regardless of the show, there are people who do watch these in spine order, like a couple of the fans and friends of the show. They're watching them in spine order. Yep. So like if they like uh, like friend of the show Oliver was saying he's a completionist. So he's trying to watch them in actual order. So when it came to this one, he's like, I don't even know how to get this movie. It's like it's not available on any online means. So like how the fuck am I supposed to watch it? Mm-hmm. And the, the hard part of it is like you probably don't need to. Pretty much. Like, <laughs> Like, we're doing it because we're trying to stick to a thing here, but at the same time, it's like, no, no, you you don't really need to watch this. And, and luckily, I own it. <laughs> like, Yeah, because if you hadn't owned it, I don't know if I would have watched this. Well, but... I, I guess I would have uh, interlibrary loaned it, and uh, we might have, mm-hmm. yeah, dealt with, we would have dealt with it, but... We would have dealt with it in one way, but mm. yeah, so... Anyways, regardless of how much I fundamentally disagree with the inclusion in the Criterion Collection for this yeah. movie. Excuse me, one second. I just coughed real rank, okay. but I, uh, I muted the f- microphone. That's interesting. I didn't know we had a mute function. Oh, yeah, I only just discovered it. Oh. Uh, go back to Nanook of the North. There was no mute at that time. <laughs> there was no mute. Uh, anyways, so regardless of what I think about this movie... As a documentary, it is pretty – I've said this already once tonight, but I I feel like it's a good way to summarize things. It's pretty toothless. Uh, It is just actors talking about this guy. It's like, oh, he was great. He was a super – he was a genius, and uh, he was a nice dude too. He did some crazy stuff, sure, but you know, uh, he was a real nice guy. And uh, he worked real hard, and uh, he made some good movies. And that's pretty much this entire thing. You do get a little bit into 
some of his movies, but what it mostly amounts to is actual just footage from those movies. You get a little bit of Jonah Arc, you get a little bit of Day Wrath, you get a little bit of Ordet, and it's just stock footage or not stock, but it's just footage from those movies where they'll show a little clip and then it'll go to the actor and it's like, yeah, so I was doing this thing and, uh, you know, uh, the guy was like, or Carl was like, you should talk like this guy. He's a funny talking guy. You should, you should talk like him. Hey, and, uh, like, cause Carl is pretty Fonzie and that's this whole thing. And then there's a narrator, which I couldn't tell if it was, words that Carl Theodore Dreyer had said or not because they would always put his face on there but the narrating seems really out of place for this like it doesn't seem like they're talking about anything related to what's going on in his movies or what's even on screen so the narrator's off the actors they don't really say anything they're just like oh yeah cool dude Uh, and then you get some stories about like the filmmaking which I think are infinitely more interesting than anything presented in this documentary about dryer like the one about joan of arc uh about the actress yeah where it's like yeah so she uh she went she moved to buenos aires she lost all her money in a casino she converted to buddhism and then uh, she disappeared no one's ever seen her since then and it's like oh shit it's like that's an interesting story i hope they talk about that more and then it's like no that's it yeah you're like oh Okay, and then they talk about Day of Wrath, and it's like, oh, yeah, uh, so we tied that old woman to a cross, and uh, we went for lunch, and, you know, we were like, hey, uh, Carl, you want to bring this old lady down from the cross for lunch? And he's like, no, no, we we leave her on cross, and you're like, oh, and they were just talking, he's like, oh, well, we didn't agree with it, but man, did it come through in the film. Yeah. Man, could you tell she was stressed out? <laughs> and it's like, all right, so... It's okay. It's like, it's not like that drastic of stuff, but at the same, it's not like things you hear now about directors or say even like Kubrick where he would like, uh, was it, uh, Shelly Duvall, Shelly Duvall, where he would just scream and scream at her all like all the time to make her just feel like shit. And then, uh, you know, she's not doing too good right now. Uh, but oh, that performance, it really, it really comes out on the screen. Yeah, exactly. So it's it's like <laughs> stories like that. They're not none of them are that extreme because some of them are based like borderline. Like, yeah, Carl was like, I asked him, could I do this? And he was like, sure, I don't care. And, you know, he's a great director for that because he really listened to me. And it's like, fuck, it's like this isn't interesting, you guys. Yeah. These are not good stories. Like because that that <sighs> that's like what a bunch of those stories are. And you're like, well. Well, All right, and, and this is like the this is how stories were told. This is how like this is the format of the '90s, and I uh, get it, but I, it, it doesn't age well at all. Like it's just kind of like, yeah, here we yeah. are. Well, look at our other '90s movies that have awesome storytelling. Uh, Chasing Con, Amy, Con Air, Con Air. Ooh, Con Air is good though. Men in Black. Men in Black. Yeah, all all the uh, creeps approved movies that uh, Face Off. <laughs> Ooh, see, great '90s <laughs> flicks. Yep. Anyways, uh, one thing I thought was funny in uh, this documentary is when uh, Dreyer is talking about Dave Rath, and he's like, "Yeah, the press didn't like it or something." He's like, "They said it was uh, they didn't like the rhythm. It was too heavy, too slow." And I was like, "Hey, that's more or less what we said about that movie. Mm-hmm. It was front heavy, and then it was too slow." But yeah, this documentary is not much. Yeah. It's a thing that's there, so so there you have it, man. This should have been one episode, but uh, <laughs> you know, here we are talking about Gertrude and me, my meteor. Meet you. Yeah. So. Yeah. Hey, RJ. What? Who who hates Gertrude? Uh, I would think maybe a lot of people, but I don't know. It's a weird wow. movie. Okay. Half a star. Vargis Egan. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Gave me a massive migraine. Dreyer's final film is like watching paint dry. Tedious is an understatement. Mm. Boom. Vargis uh, likes Raging Bull and Old Boy. Yeah. I, he yeah. must have some uh, family issues. Yeah. Uh, Kiss Boy, half a star. <laughs> the only thing this movie values more than seeing how far up its own arse it can get is being. Mm. Endless. 
If you want to do a play, do the play and do it well. If you want to make a movie, make the movie and make it well. This contrary piece of cinematic tranquilizer instead went, I'll make a movie play and make it shitty. (laughs) Hmm. Uh, I kind of agree with the play stuff. Um, This kissy boy is all over the map. They got Fellowship of the Rings in their favorite films, which I agree with wholeheartedly. But they also have Shape of Water in there, which Mm. I disagree with. Yeah. wholeheartedly yeah uh yeah you know that play thing it recalls uh the magic flute for me the 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 stinker yeah. in the bergman empire um mm-hmm. yeah man yeah i'm with you yeah i'm with you Fe- feeding brett uh one and a half star for gertrude the romantic aches and reaches or sorry this is Ger- yeah sorry gertrude what am I doing? Yeah, yeah. The romantic yeah, yeah. aches and reaches of Gertrude's heart churns along as I sat patiently, waiting for something to arrive to lock myself in and embrace its themes. Unfortunately, it crumbles in the off-putting pacing that recalls his previous films, but here lacks the equal impact of its content, leaving an impression that pleads me to alienate from it. There is no doubt that what is presented in front of me is a familiar fragment of Dreyer's filmmaking, as all the trademarks are present but it feels to be his most dispassionate while also his most indulgent as characters stare upon blank off-screen spaces simulating a processing Mm. mind, but instead depicting upon a disinterested reflection of its viewing audience. It left me restless and anxious for it to reach its eventual end. The weight was overbearing and I wished upon for it to arrive sooner. So this feeding Brett, Jarrett? Yo. Uh, one of their favorite films is The Passion of uh, Jean d'Arc. Mm. Uh, so they are a Dreyer fan. Yeah. Uh, I, I think I, I think this could be a future friend of the show. They got some Criterion lists. They watch a lot of Criterion films. Yeah. They're from Australia. We're, we're big in Australia. We are. Yeah, in uh, those Australia, Africa, New Zealand continents. Not continents. So... So for uh, for my meat here, uh, there's yeah. not like any particular hate because like very few people, like 226 here, have watched it. Uh, mm-hmm. The lowest rating is three stars. Okay. Um, <laughs> Matthew Roberts, frankly, awfully filmed interviews in too brisk a pace for the narration, skipping yes. over some silent works in their entirety, occasionally suffering from being too surface level. What makes this documentary most worthwhile are the extracts from Dreyer's own diaries. His writings, clearly expressing his own thoughts, attitudes, perceptions, are invaluable. Uh, the glowing entry, one of hope and love for life, film, is a wonderful and optimistic passage mm-hmm. that really touches my heart. Perhaps best watched for the most casual or beginner fans of Dreyer, given his difficult reputation. Yeah, I don't know about that. It works very well at painting a mm-hmm. much more rounded portrait of the filmmaker and his ideas in much more understanding words than a number of essays are going to do. So, uh, yeah, I disagree with that. <laughs> I think you can learn a lot more from reading uh, than this documentary. Yep, I you, agree with that too. You, you could cover a lot more ground in an hour and a half reading uh, than uh, watching this. Yeah, this is a big Criterion guy. Got a lot of Criterions in there. Yeah, in I, think the, I think the only people digging into this are going to be Criterion people. Yeah, uh, but uh, this person also has a Stanley Kubrick ratings lists, and they have Lolita at number four over The Shining, over Barry Lyndon, over 2001, over Full Metal Jacket. Hmm. And, you know, I just can't jive with that because I don't think Lovita is that great. So uh, there you go. We have Russ Man, a little dry, three stars. Uh, we have uh, wow. uh, another uh, Criterion type, uh, Ben DeBono. I'm a little baffled as to why Criterion gave this its own spine number in the collection. It's really nothing more than a series of behind-the-scenes features on Dreyer's more famous films. There's some great information here, and I love the quotes from Dreyer himself. But as a full-on documentary on his work, it fell short. Yep. That's, I think, about it. And I think three stars is pretty generous because I don't even think this is, like, even, like, an average documentary. This is nope. not not a good documentary. Nope. Yeah. I agree with you, Jay. Wow. Here we are. Yes. Consensus reached. Here we are. Yeah. That's all I got to say, RJ. Well, there you go. Done. Um, after the break, we will continue staring off into... Blankness. Something? No. Anything? And abusing our actors for our art. <laughs> <laughs> 